All right, welcome back to another Calculus 3 lesson. Um, so just a little, uh, let's kind of get a bird's eye view of uh, what's going on with the class right now. Um, so a week from today, we're going to have our third exam. And our third exam will be over uh, double and triple integration. Uh, the last lesson that we're going to be covering for that is today's lesson, so triple integrals in spherical coordinates. And so today's last lesson is gonna be on the exam one week from today. Uh, Wednesday is our recharge day since we don't have spring break this semester, so there won't be any class on that day. And then on Friday, we're going to begin the next lesson of the final part of the course. Um, and then on Monday, this coming Monday on the day of the exam, uh, we're going to have review on that day. Now, that means we're only having one review uh, this time as opposed to our usual two. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to, uh, Dr. Huang and I are each going to do uh, an old exam, and we're going to post videos of that online sometime this week. So sometime later this week, you should see a video from me and from Dr. Huang uh, going over uh, some of the old exams. So if you guys want to review, I'd recommend taking a look at that. And then we'll have general question and answer uh, this coming Monday right here. All right. And uh, oh, yeah, what's up? Uh, no, the final is not cumulative. So the final is essentially like a more heavily weighted midterm. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think the university requires us to weight finals at least a certain percentage. So that's the only reason it's worth more than the others. But yeah, the final is not cumulative. By the way, our semester is starting to come to a close. We only have five weeks left of the class of the semester. So uh, kind of, feel, I don't know, this, this semester feels like it's taken forever, but uh, the end is in sight. At least it's starting to get there. All right, anyways, enough about that. Let's go ahead and talk about our final um, topic for this chapter, triple integrals, integrals in spherical coordinates. So last lesson, we saw how cylindrical coordinates turned a lot of integrals that would have been uh, very difficult or impossible uh, normally and turned them into relatively easy integrals to do by using uh, the circular symmetry uh, embedded into cylindrical coordinates. Uh, today, we're going to do something similar, only we're going to use spherical coordinates instead. And as the name implies, spherical coordinates are best used when you have some sort of sphere involved in your problem. You technically don't need a sphere in order to use spherical coordinates, but I strongly recommend that you only use them if you have one. Typically, if you have some kind of circular symmetry that isn't a sphere, cylindrical coordinates are often better for that. Um, all right, anyways, uh, so remember, whenever we do any kind of change of coordinates, uh, we need to compute uh, the Jacobian of the transformation. So this is effectively like the du of our substitution. So what we need to do is we need to learn what the, the du or the Jacobian is for spherical coordinates right here. So with cylindrical, it was relatively simple. It was r dz dr d theta. So we just stuck an extra r there. What's it going to be for spherical coordinates? Now, there are two ways of getting the Jacobian for rho, theta, and phi. The first way, which we're not going to do, because it takes a long time, is we simply just use the definition of the Jacobian along with our coordinate transformations. So we have x is rho cosine of theta sine of phi, y is rho sine of theta sine of phi, and z is rho cosine of so using these, we make a three by three determinant, uh, and then we compute what that is. And that would definitely get you the correct Jacobian, uh, but it takes a long time to do that determinant. It's really ugly. And you have to do a lot of uh, trig identities and stuff. So we're not gonna do it that way. Although if you wanna see it this way, I encourage you to uh, maybe try it on your own. The second way illustrates that when it comes to transformation, sometimes the whole is harder than the sum of the parts. What we're going to do instead is we're gonna go from X, Y, Z to R, theta, and Z. So from rectangular to cylindrical, and then we'll go from cylindrical to spherical. And this is a much gentler transition to going directly from here to here. So if we go from X, Y, Z to R, theta, and Z, we take dx, dy, dz, and it turns into r, dr, d theta. Oh, and then dz, oops. Okay, so we know we accumulate uh, an extra r along the way here. Uh, so we're gonna have to convert that 
in the spherical coordinates, first of all. And I want to give you a very important formula that's going to be very useful today. R is going to be rho sine of phi. So kind of like how Z is rho cosine of phi, R, the distance from in the XY plane from the origin, is going to be rho sine of phi. So when we convert from here to rho theta and phi, this R is going to turn into a rho sine of phi. And then we might get something else from this Jacobian. And then we have uh, d rho d phi d theta right here. So we just need to figure out if there's anything extra we get from the Jacobian going from here to here. Because we know going from here to here, we get an R. And in the spherical world, R is rho sine of phi. So let's write down the conversions from cylindrical to spherical. So I wrote down what R was already. It's rho sine of phi. Theta, well, theta is actually something they just share. It's kind of like how this shared Z right here, we're gonna share theta here. So theta is theta is our kind of stupid uh, coordinate transformation here. And then Z, we also wrote what Z was earlier, it's rho cosine of phi. So what we could do is we can make the Jacobian matrix using these instead. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do the rho derivative of R, which is sine of phi. We're gonna do the theta derivative of R, which is zero. And we're gonna do the phi derivative of R, which is rho cosine of phi. Okay, this one will be relatively easy. What am I gonna write down for this rho here, for the uh, rho, theta, and phi derivative here? Yeah, zero, one, zero. All right, people seem to think that's it, and that is correct. So the rho derivative of this is zero. The theta derivative of theta is one. And then the phi derivative of theta is zero. All right, and then finally, we'll do our Jacobian for um, this, our last row of our Jacobian matrix. Uh, so we do the rho derivative here. We have cosine of phi. We do the theta derivative of this and get zero. And then we do the phi derivative of this and get negative rho sine of phi right here. Okay, let's go ahead and do this determinant now. Um, so let's see here. We have sine of phi times uh, this determinant. And you'll have to take my word for it. This is actually the easier way of doing this. Doing it this first way up here still would have taken longer. I have no clue how any of that just happened. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking, we have R, theta, and Z here, right? And we're taking each possible derivative of these. So we're doing the rho derivative, the theta derivative, and the phi derivative. So we did the rho derivative of this and just got sine of phi. We did the theta derivative here and we have zero right here. And then we did the phi derivative and have cosine of phi. And I just did each possible derivative for all three of these equations here. My goal is to get the Jacobian going from here to here. Okay, so now let's do zero times this, but zero times this minor will be zero. And then we have rho cosine of phi times the minor zero one cosine of phi zero. All right. So now let's see here, the determinant of this will be a uh, negative rho sine squared of phi. And then the determinant of this will be zero minus cosine of phi. So we have minus rho cosine squared of phi. And would you look at that? We end up getting negative rho from this using a Pythagorean pair right here. So what do we get in addition to the rho sine of phi from our R earlier? Uh, we get, well, it's going to be the absolute value of negative rho. So what's the overall conversion if we want to go from dx, dy, dz all the way to spherical coordinates, we're going to have these and then d rho, d phi, d theta. So if I combine these together, I have rho squared sine of phi. d rho, d phi, d theta. Now, this is the important part here. This is kind of the moral of the story of doing all this 
You don't need to compute this from scratch every time. That would take an immense amount of time. All you need to do is remember that if you're going from uh, rectangular coordinates all the way to spherical coordinates, you're going to have to tack on not just an R, but a row squared sine of phi. So the Jacobian for this one's a little bit more tricky than it was for cylindrical, but uh, it's still, we're just going to tack on one of these. Dr. Manley, I have a question. Uh, yeah, what's up? In lecture 21, the conversions from X, Y, and Z are different. Like you put X equals rho cosine theta sine phi. But in lecture 21, it says X equals rho sine phi times cosine of theta. Is that the same? Like, does that matter or? Well, yeah, it doesn't matter what order you multiply things in. So yeah, that's-, that's Oh, yeah, oh, I'm stupid. You're right. Thank that's you. Right. <laughs> Who exactly is this Jacobian dude? Honestly, I have no idea. I'm actually really ignorant to, to math history. Uh, yeah, what's up? Uh, yeah, if you already have the R there. Yeah, if you already have the R there that's inherent in that DV, then yes, you just, you just multiply by the R. All right. If F is continuous over the solid region, um, and here we have a region defined in terms of spherical coordinates right here, um, then we can change our integral into the following. We have f of rho, theta, and phi, and then we have our mandatory rho, uh, rho squared sine of phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. And then it says rho goes between these two surfaces here. So we're gonna put those on. And then um, phi here is between a and b, and theta is between alpha and beta. So this is how usually how we're going to end up converting our, uh, this is how we're going to end up writing out our uh, spherical coordinate integrals right here. Um, why is it d rho phi and theta if it's the inside the coordinates that are d rho or their rho theta and phi? Uh, this order doesn't really have anything to do uh, with the order of the, um, order of the differentials here. Remember, kind of like how back when we had x, y, and z, you can integrate those in any order so long as you convert the integral properly. It's the same thing here. Just because it's written this way in the function doesn't mean it needs to be written uh, this way here. Is it easier to do it that way? Yeah, this is usually the easiest order. I honestly don't remember the last time I had to switch the order for this. So that, I guess that's evidence that this is probably the easiest way of doing it. All right, let's review a little bit um, about some common cur or so sorry, common surfaces we have with spherical coordinates. So let's see, rho equals one. Can anyone describe at least verbally or via text uh, what this is going to be? Yeah, this is gonna be a sphere and specifically it's gonna be a sphere of radius one. So let me attempt to draw that. My spheres haven't been very good recently. Eh, no, all right, well, <laughs> that's a sphere of radius one. Okay. All right, let's see. Theta equals pi over three. This one's a little bit different. Does anyone know what theta equals pi over three is? What kind of surface would that be? That's right, it's going to be a plane. So we go out to the angle, theta is pi over three, maybe like this. Well, I think it's a little steeper, like that. So this is pi over three. And then we have every possible coordinate in that direction. So we have any rho value, any phi value, but we need to make sure that our theta value is pi over three. So this is going to be a plane in the direction theta is pi over three here. All right. Next, we have C is, or phi, sorry, sounds similar to C, I guess, but phi is going to be pi over four. Does anyone know what kind of shape this will be? I think we've encountered this previously. It's going to be a cone. That's right. So we're going to draw in the pi over four direction here with respect to phi, pi over four. And then we can have anything we want with any theta value. Every theta value gives us everything around the circle. 
And we can have any row value, meaning we can extend this out as far as we want here. So I just want you guys to be familiar with the different constant functions in sphere coordinates, because these do uh, show up. So if you see a cone, a sphere, or a plane that looks like this, they're very easy to specify in uh, spherical coordinates here. All right. Okay, enough review slash uh, preliminaries. Let's go ahead and actually do a triple integral with spherical coordinates. So let's evaluate the, the integral 2z dv, where e is the solid bounded by the hemisphere, z is root 4 minus x squared minus y squared, and the xy plane. All right, so if they didn't tell us to use spherical coordinates, let's say we were out in the wild and we just had to do this integral on our own, why would we use spherical coordinates? Well, the answer is, is that this is a sphere. Because if we simplify this, or I guess not simplify, but modify it, we have x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to four. So this is going to be our surface here. And remember, it's bounded below by the xy plane. So this is going to be a hemisphere, like we said. There we go. That's a little bit better than I usually do. All right. So this is going to be our hemisphere right here. And we're bounded below by the xy plane. All right. Let's go ahead and convert this into spherical coordinates. So first, let's take a look at the integral. So we have 2z, right? Now, in terms of spherical coordinates, z is rho cosine of phi right here. So we have two rho cosine of phi, and then we can't forget about the Jacobian, which will be rho squared sine of phi, um, d rho d phi, d theta. All right, now let's go ahead and write down our bounds. So let's see, our bounds for rho, well, we include the origin, and typically when we include the origin, our bottom bound is going to be uh, rho equals zero because we can go all the way a distance of zero from the origin. And then what will our upper bound be for this? What's, what's the upper bound for rho here? It's going to be two, that's right. So there's a sphere of radius two here. All right, so even though, remember, even though these are constant bound, like they look like constants here, uh, they're technically 2D surfaces. Well, maybe this isn't, there's a degenerate sphere of radius zero, uh, but this is a 2D surface. Uh, with this hemisphere here. All right, now, now let's talk about phi. So, so far, if we only have zero to two here, that could include the whole sphere. So how do we specify that we're stopping here at the xy plane right here? Uh, what was that? Uh, yeah, so we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna use phi right here and it's gonna go from zero to pi over two rather than the full pi that it usually goes. So zero to pi over two means we can tilt all the way down to the xy plane right here, um, but then we have to stop. If we wanted the whole sphere, we would do this from zero to pi. And then finally, since we can revolve all the way around the z axis, uh, the, the theta is gonna have the full range of zero uh, to two pi here. So anyways, there we go, there is our integral. And if we clean up the integrand a little bit, we're gonna have rho cubed times two sine of phi, cosine of phi. And there's another simpler name that this goes by. It's sine of two phi. All right. Um, can I re-explain the bounds for phi? Yeah, so phi equals zero is along the z-axis, right? And as we rotate downwards, uh, our phi increases. Now we can't rotate, past pi over two here, because if we did, we would start getting into negative territory uh, for z right here. So phi can only go from zero to pi over two. It can only rotate down that much right there. Are we assuming that rho is positive? Uh, yeah, kind of like how r was always positive, rho is just going to be positive. Is rho just the radius? It's the radius of the sphere. Rho is the distance from each point uh, to the origin. All right, now let's go ahead and just do this uh, integral here. And thankfully we have all constant bounds and we have a function that we can um, split over multiplication here. 
So that means that we could rewrite this integral as zero to two pi d theta, zero to pi over two sine of two phi d phi, and zero to two rho cube d rho. All right, so we were able to save an immense amount of time uh, doing that. So let's go ahead and do this integral here. It's the integral of one. So we get theta, and then we plug two pi and zero into that. So kind of just to save time, whenever you have the integral of just something d theta, it's just going to be however the distance, however long the distance is between these two bounds. So it's gonna be two pi here. All right, the integral um, for sine of two phi, that's going to be negative cosine of two phi over two from zero to pi over two. I guess we'll come back to that in a moment. And then the integral here is going to be rho to the fourth over four from zero to two right here. All right, so let's plug in the stuff. So I have negative cosine, and if I put pi over two in here, it's gonna be negative cosine of pi. That's gonna give me one, and then I divide by two. So I have one half. Now, when I plug zero in here, zero is the bottom bound, so I'm subtracting it. And I'm subtracting a negative. The cosine of zero is one, and subtracting a negative will make it positive. So I end up just getting another half. For this. So this is a very fancy way of writing the number one. And then with this right here, I plug two into the fourth power, it's 16, divided by four is four, and I plug zero in there and get nothing. So this is four. So two pi times one times four ends up giving us eight pi here. So this is going to be the value of our integral. We'll only be asked to convert to spherical for spheres or will they give us all types of shapes? Yeah, we're gonna see in a little bit, we'll have more than just spheres. Uh, for spherical coordinates. Spherical coordinates can do all right with cones and cylinders and planes as well. All right. Set up a triple integral in spherical coordinates for the volume of the ice cream cone shaped region bounded by the cone z is root 3x squared plus 3y squared and the hemisphere z is root 4 minus x squared minus y squared. So I guess this is a variation on the ice cream cone problem we did before. Uh, this time the top really is going to be uh, a sphere or at least a chunk of a sphere right here. All right, so let's go ahead and draw this. So Z is root three X squared plus root uh, plus three Y squared. That is going to look like this. All right, so there's our cone. All right, and then the hemisphere, well, we just saw this in the previous problem. Uh, this is the very same hemisphere. Going to come down like this over the top, like that, and then connected by a circle. All right, so effectively, what we're doing is we're finding the volume of all of this right here. So that's what we're finding the volume of. Okay, so let's go ahead and set this up in spherical coordinates. Okay, well, we're doing the volume of something. So that's one dV, right? Where um, I guess I'll call this R for our region. Now, dV in spherical coordinates, we have to stick in our Jacobian. So we have rho squared sine of phi, and then the traditional order is d rho d phi d theta. All right, so we have to integrate uh, this, the rho squared sine of phi by default, but nothing else because we were, had a one for our original thing. Okay, now we just need to get the bounds for rho, phi, theta. Now let's see here. Uh, for rho, we include the origin here. So rho needs to be as small as zero. Um, and it could be as big, well, the biggest rho can be is we go out to the sphere of radius two. So once again, our, we're gonna be bounded in between zero and two for our row right here. Why is that what we integrate? Because it's the Jacobian. It comes from converting, um, every time we have a DV, it's going to include the Jacobian 
along with our um, differentials there. All right, now we need to get the cone here. Now let's go back a few pages. Remember what the cone was, the cone was a constant phi value, right? So let's figure out which phi value this is going to be. So we start off with Z is root three times root X squared plus Y squared, right? If we factor that out. Um, so root X squared plus Y squared, that's the same thing as R where R is from back from cylindrical coordinates. Now I gave you a useful formula earlier today. Let's recall what that was. Um, R is equal to, oh, there it is. R is equal to rho sine of phi right here. And Z is rho cosine of phi. So we have rho cosine of phi is root three rho sine of phi. All right, now provided our row isn't zero, and we've already handled that case here, uh, we could divide that away. And then we have cosine of phi is root three sine of phi. And if we do some division here, one over root three is sine of phi over cosine of phi, AKA tangent of phi. Um, what angle are we going to get for uh, phi? right here. It's going to be pi over six. That's right. So I have some questions about the, the row bounds here. Why do we just put two and not a function? Two is the function. Uh, this is just the constant function rho equals two, uh, which is a sphere of radius two. That's kind of like the domed part right here. So that's our upper bound. And then rho equals zero, since we're all the way to the origin here, is our lower bound. So that's why we had just a constant function for right there. All right, so we know that phi, uh, so we can be at phi equals zero, that's no problem, but we can't ro rotate down any further than phi is pi over six, because if we did, we'd start being outside of the cone and our ice cream would be leaking. So we need to make sure that this is from zero to pi over six right here. All right, and then since we can go all the way around the circle, we could spin all the way around the z-axis with no issue, this will go from zero to two pi right here. What are the default bounds for phi? If you wanna get the entire sphere, like you wanna get past the cone and then all the way down to negative Z, uh, phi can extend all the way to pi. Uh, so zero to pi. Um, but yeah, it's, for both the problems we've had so far, we've had a limitation on what phi can be. All right, now we need to do this integral. And once again, this is an integral where we could use our multiplication trick to help speed things along. And that's always appreciated because even if you know exactly what you're doing with these triple integrals, as you probably experienced, they can take a long time to do. So we split it up over multiplication like this. All right. And then from this integral, since we're just integrating one, will be the distance between these two, which will be two pi. Then we integrate sine of phi, which is going to be negative cosine of phi. From zero to pi over six. I guess we'll return to that in a moment. And then we integrate rho squared and get rho cubed over three from zero to two right here. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. Yeah, Robert, you have a good point there. <laughs> they said just set up the triple integral. I got a little too enthusiastic here. Um, so I'll leave the rest to you guys. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, we only needed to set this up. Um, that's a, a periodic reminder. Don't do more than the question uh, asks you to do here. How do you know you could split the integral up? Uh, it's because we have a function of rho times a function of phi. It could split over multiplication. We need a function that kind of looks like this where we can kind of split it up into its row and phi and maybe theta parts. And then all of these need to be constant. Then we could do this multiplication trick. Finish it for fun. Um, all right, we're almost done anyway. So we have two pi. Uh, cosine of pi over six is uh, root three over two. So this is negative root three over two. 
And then I subtract negative one. Yeah, so this is gonna be plus one. And then this is eight thirds. There we go, we finished it uh, relatively quickly here. Why is theta two pi instead of pi? Because we're going starting from theta equals zero, we go all the way around the Z axis here. We have a full um, 360 degrees rotation for our um, ice cream cone here. Okay, the next one says set up an integral. So you'll have to stop me if I actually start, start doing it here. Um, set up a triple integral in spherical coordinates for the volume of the region bounded above by the sphere rows two cosine of phi and below by the hemisphere um, rho equals one with z greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Now, I think we may have went over this in the, in the video I made about um, uh, cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Um, but in case we didn't, let's, let's go over this. What, what kind of curve is, or what kind of surface, excuse me, is this going to be? Yeah, that's right. So it's going to be a sphere and it's going to be moved in the Z direction. So this is going to be a sphere of diameter two and it's going to be in the Z direction. So we have our sphere and this is the point zero, zero, one. So that's a good thing to remember. Rho equals two cosine of phi sphere of diameter two in Z direction. Okay, how would we know that uh, if we didn't uh, have this memorized or something like that? What we would do is we multiply both sides of this equation by rho. And why would we think of that? Well, rho cosine of phi is Z. So that's how we can flip the right-hand side into something more familiar. So if we multiply both sides by rho, we have rho squared, is two rho cosine of phi. And we know what this is with rectangular. And we also know what this is with rectangular. And then what we would do next is we would um, complete the square. And that would give us our uh, center point with Z right here. All right, so there is our rho is two cosine of phi. So it's bounded above by this. We can't go above the sphere. And it's bounded below by the hemisphere, rho is one. So that's going to come right up there and stop. Okay, so we're trying to find all of the volume that's above this hemisphere, but within um, the sphere up here. Okay, so let's go ahead and set up the integral. So we're doing, um, we're trying to find a volume, right? So that's going to mean that we're gonna integrate rho squared sine of phi. So that's going to be our integrand here. And that's the same integrand whenever we need to use vol or need to find volume in spherical coordinates. Okay, so let's see here. Um, what is our upper bound for rho? Well, the upper bound is this curve right here. So this is going to be two cosine of phi. Okay, so if we were to do this one, which we won't, it just said set up, uh, we couldn't do the multiplication trick here because we have a non-constant bound. So this one we would need to kind of do the long way here. All right. And then what is our lower bound here? It's not going to be zero this time because we're not including the origin here. Uh, so what is our lower bound for this? That's right. We can't go below the sphere of radius one centered at the origin. So this is going to go from one to two cosine of phi. All right, now let's take a look at the, the phi bounds here. So we can go all the way up the Z axis with no problem. We can go up this way with no issue. So we're going to have zero as a lower bound for phi. And then as we keep going, we can rotate until eventually we rotate this far and then we hit where they end up uh, intersecting. So we need to see what phi value uh, that's going to happen at. 
So where do these intersect? Well, we substitute the equations into each other. So we have one is two cosine of B, except these equal to each other. Uh, one half is cosine of phi, meaning that phi is going to be pi over three. So we're gonna rotate from zero to pi over three right here. But we can't rotate downwards any more than that because then we would be invading the hemispheres territory here. And then what is theta going to be for this? Yeah, Tristan's got it. It's going to be zero to two pi here. Because once again, there's no restriction on how we can spin around the z axis. So this integral right here would be our triple integral for um, the volume of this region right here. All right. And we're not going to go, we're not going to do this one. Although that would be good practice uh, doing um, spherical coordinates. Oh, uh, yeah. What's up? Given rho equals a sine phi, how would that work, or is that usually not given? Um, hmm, that one would be a bit rougher. Would be you would have to complete the square in both x and y, so it'd probably be going in the r direction, which is this way. Um, I'm not sure about the diameter. That might part might be a bit different. To be honest, I haven't seen a sphere like that before, um, but. Yeah, you would, you would, what you would do is you would have rho cosine of sine of phi, and then this would be x squared plus y squared right here. All right. Oh, sorry, did the volume blow up? I apologize. All right. If E is the solid that lies inside the hemisphere, Z is root 16 minus x squared minus y squared, and outside the cylinder, x squared plus y squared is four and above the x, y points, there's a lot of conditions here, convert the integral of the region E of one over x squared plus y squared dV into cylindrical coordinates and convert it into spherical coordinates. So this exercise is gonna be evident, or this, uh, this exercise is going to explain why I usually prefer uh, cylindrical coordinates um, but it also shows that spherical coordinates isn't really a bad choice either, right here. All right, let's draw this region. So we've seen this guy, I think this is the third time we've seen it now. Oh, actually, no, wait, no, this is radius four now. So we have a sphere of radius four. It helps to draw the negative axis guidelines. There we go. There's our sphere of, or hemisphere of radius four. Uh, we're bounded below by the xy plane, so that's why I stopped. I didn't draw the full sphere right here. And then we have the cylinder x squared plus y squared is four. So it's going to be a radius two cylinder. That's going to go up like this. So the cylinder is the bad zone. We're not allowed to be inside. The cylinder. We need to be outside of the cylinder, but inside the sphere right here. Um, so if we were to look at this from top down, we would have a circle of radius two and then a circle of radius four. Okay. So let's see here. Let's do cylindrical coordinates first. All right. So let's change our integral into cylindrical. Um, so one over x squared plus y squared is the same thing as one over r squared. And then we have r dz dr d theta. Okay. Now let's see here. What is our z going to be? Well, the highest Z value we could possibly have, we're kind of bounded above by this hemisphere, right? So our Z is going to be bounded above by the hemisphere, 16 minus R squared, because that's what X squared plus Y squared is right here. And then below, it goes all the way down to Z equals zero, or the XY plane. 
All right, next we have R. So we look at this, we kind of squash down the Z dimension and focus on the X, Y plane here. Uh, what will our bounds for R be here? Yeah, we're doing it just from two to four. That's right. Why do we not use row squared sine of E? Because we're doing cylindrical uh, for this right here. All right, and then finally, we're going all the way around the Z axis. So our theta will go from zero to two pi here. All right, so that's how we set things up with um, cylindrical coordinates here. Now let's go ahead and set things up with uh, spherical coordinates. Okay, now let's see here, what is one over X squared plus Y squared going to be uh, with spherical coordinates. Well, we saw earlier that it was one over R squared, right? And then we saw earlier today that R is rho sine of phi. So if we have R squared down here, we're gonna have rho squared sine squared of phi. That's what X squared plus Y squared will turn into here. And then we have to have the Jacobian as well. So this was the integrand we had besides dV. And then we're going to throw in the Jacobian, which is rho squared sine of phi. D rho, d phi, d theta, right here. All right, that's kind of convenient because I guess these cancel out, one of these cancels out. You're just integrating cosecant of phi for this one. All right, so let's take a look at our rho here. So the key way to think about rho is that larger rho is further from the origin and smaller rho is closer to the origin right here. So the further from the origin surface we're looking at is the sphere, right? So that's going to be a sphere of radius four. So our upper bend will just be four for this. Now, the closest we can get to the origin, uh, that's kind of the origin is blocked off by this cylinder, right? So that's actually gonna be our lower bound for rho is the equation for the cylinder. Uh, but what is the equation for uh, the cylinder here? Uh, well, let's see here. We have x squared plus y squared is four, but x squared plus y squared is r squared is four or r equals two. So r equals two, well, we know what r is with spherical right here. Uh, R is rho sine of phi. Okay, so if, then if we divide both sides by sine, rho will be two cosecant of phi. And that's going to be our lower bound. So as odd as this seems, this is going to be the equation for a cylinder of radius two in spherical coordinates. And this is why I don't like using spherical coordinates for non-spheres, is then you start getting uh, rather awkward functions like cosecant. All right, next we're doing phi right here. So this, this time we're actually kind of restricted on our phi. So phi can't just be zero, right? Phi can't include zero right here because that would be right inside the cylinder. So what we need to do is we need to start where they meet, and then we could start having phi's after that. And then we're gonna go all the way down to phi is pi over two, because we're bounded below by the x, y plane. So our upper bound for phi will be pi over two. Uh, now let's see here, we need to get what our lower bound for phi is right here. All right. So yeah, it looks pretty narrow, probably pi over six. Yeah, let, that's probably a good guess. Uh, let's see here. So let's set these two equations equal to one another or substitute one into the other, and that will give us our Z. So Z is gonna be the square root of 16 minus X squared plus Y squared, right? But X squared plus Y squared is four when we're on the cylinder. So Z is equal to root 12. All right, now Z in terms of, um, Z in terms of spherical coordinates is rho cosine of phi. So rho cosine of phi is root 12. 
Now, if we're on the sphere, um, if we're on the sphere here, what's our row going to be? It's gonna it's gonna be four, right? Um, so if I simplify root twelve, that's two root three, and if I divide by four, I have cosine of phi is root three over two. So the phi that we get for that is pi over six. So <laughs> yeah, we were we were right about that. It, it did end up being pi over six. All right. And then finally, the theta is literally the same theta that we had earlier here. So we go from zero uh, to two pi here. All right, so setting things up with spherical was uh, uh, probably a bit more difficult, at least in my opinion, uh, than doing things with uh, cylindrical. So in, in general, I would advise only using spherical coordinates when you have actual spheres in the problem. Because as you can see, uh, things that aren't spheres tend to have a bit messier representations with spherical coordinates. Why is the upper bound being pi over two? It's because we have the xy plane as our lower bound. So we can't rotate downwards more than the xy plane. Can I draw out where phi of pi over six is? Yeah, so it's where, it's at this, where the cylinder meets the sphere. It's going to be this angle right here. This is phi. It's gonna be this angle right here. Okay, we have one more problem here and then that's it for today. So according to Archimedes, the volume of a ball is two thirds of the volume of the circumscribed cylinder. So we could use this to find the volume of a unit ball, which is four pi over three. So use this fact and the technique for change of variables to find the volume enclosed by the ellipsoid x squared over four plus y squared over nine plus z squared equals one right here. All right. Why is it a ball? Um, usually they say ball if they want to include um, the volume part. So if they, if they wanna actually include everything in here, they'll say uh, ball. All right, now we wanna get this to look like a sphere, right? Cause we know that, or I guess the, the unit ball has a volume of four pi over three. So if we can get this to look like and have the equation of the unit sphere here, uh, then we could just use the fact that we know what the volume of the sphere of radius one is. All right, so we need to use a change of variables though. So this isn't quite looking like a sphere. So we need to modify maybe X and Y. I think Z is probably okay though. Um, what do you think I should make X? Uh, two U, that's right. And then in the same vein, we're gonna make Y equal to three V. And then Z, well, Z was fine. Z could just be Z right here. All right, so what we're doing is we're trying to find the volume over this ellipsoid, right? I'm gonna call that E for ellipsoid. So what I wanna do is I wanna convert this into these coordinates right here. So I need to know what the Jacobian is. So the u derivative of x is two, the v derivative of x is zero, and the z derivative of x is zero. The u derivative of y is zero, the v derivative of y is three, and the z derivative of y is zero. And then the x derivative of z is zero, the y derivative of z is zero, and the z derivative of z is one. Okay, so we need to find the determinant of this matrix right here. This is going to give us our Jacobian. Now, the, the fact is, is that if you ever have a diagonal matrix, this is called a diagonal matrix where we only have non-zero entries uh, down, coming down and to the right here. All we need to do is just multiply all the numbers together. So we just do two times three times one gives us six. So this is gonna be our Jacobian. So we end up with six uh, du, dv, dz. Now in the u, v, and z world, let's substitute these in and see what we get. So if I plug in x is two u into here, I have four u squared over four. 
if I plug 3v into here, I have 9v squared over 9. And then z equals z, we just keep that. So if I cancel these out, I have u squared plus v squared plus z squared right here. Um, and that's just going to be uh, the sphere. So this is going over the sphere in the UVZ space. So this is going to be six times the volume of a sphere in UVZ. And they said earlier that the volume of a sphere, radius one, will be six, or it's going to be four pi over two. So we end up with 24 pi over three being the volume for our ellipsoid right here. Yeah, how do we get these equations? We knew that um, this kind of looked like a sphere, but we needed to get rid of this four and this nine. And since I was squaring X and Y, I took the square roots of four and nine and made them be the variables there. So that all disappears right here. All right. How do you know of, um, when a bound is gonna be a constant versus a variable function? It depends on what kind of coordinate system you're using and what kind of shapes you have. So if you're using spherical coordinates, for example, um, a sphere will have a constant bound, um, but something like a cylinder might not. Um, it just kind of depends on your, your coordinate system. It's different um, each time, here, unfortunately. All right, that's about it for today. Um, so like I said, we're not having class on Wednesday. And then on Friday, I'll start introducing the last chapter of the class. So I will see you guys then.